Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. So today I'd like to talk about our work, which we called using X vectors for speech activated detection in broadcast streams. So let me start with a brief motivation. So we are developing a 24 seven monitoring system for broadcast streams. And in this system, we are processing a lot of streams. And we first start with speech activated detection to basically filter out non speech parts. And after that, on the speech parts, we provide tasks such as speech transcription or X vector by based tasks such as speaker diarization, or speaker recognition. In this work, we would like to unify our input features to be the X vectors so we can save some computational demands. So this is all about. So just to be sure, speech active detection is a technique for detecting speech and non-speech in segments in audio. It's usually treated as a machine learning task and it's used as a speech preprocessor pre in mostly any speech processing applications. There are some issues such as unseen noises or speech in music and so on, but the online variant imposes further restrictions such as uh, we have to use only left to right processing, we have to keep computational demands in mind, it has to run in real time and so on. For the X vectors, these are fixed dimensional representations of variable length utterances. Uh, they are usually extracted by deep neural networks. They were originally crafted for speaker recognition, but since then they became popular for many other tasks. So to sum up the motivation, uh, we want to build an online speech activated detector, which would use the X vectors. And we of course like to improve the performance of the speech active detection and also of the follow-up speech processing tasks such as speech transcription. So let me show you our proposed approach. Uh, it consists of three consecutive steps. I'll go through each of them now. So the first one is the X vector extraction. So for this, uh, we are using a feed forward sequential memory network. It's usually used for modeling long time dependencies in the input signal without using the recurrent neural networks. And it's basically just a feed forward deep neural network with learnable memory blocks in its hidden layers. We use this network to produce the speaker embeddings, the X vectors. You can see the yeah, you can see the structure here. So we have uh, six uh, FSMN layers, where the first one is a normalization layer. It applies capstar mean subtraction, and it's then followed by two fully connected layers, uh, which are divided by the pooling layer, which computes uh, means of the frames. And finally, we have the softmax layer uh, where the number of neurons corresponds to the number of speakers. For the inputs, we are using uh, 40 dimensional log filter banks. And for the outputs, the X vectors are then 128 uh, dimensional. They are extracted after the pooling layer and we are extracting them with a frame shift of one so we can use them in a frame wise mode. The second step is the, is the binary classification. So for this, we are using a simple feed forward fully connected deep neural network, which is also a shallow. Uh, it basically takes just the extracted X vectors and produces probabilities for the speech and non-speech classes for each frame. Uh, as I said, it's a shallow network. It has only two hidden layers and we are not providing it with any other input context because it should be in the X vectors already. The last part is the smoothing of the outputs. So for this, uh, we proposed a whited finite state transducers, which function uh, as an online decoder. Uh, so they basically took the outputs of the classifier and smooth it. Uh, how it works is that we have two transducers. So we have uh, this one. This represents the in input recording. It's just uh, uh, one frame. And then we have the right one. Uh, I can so this one. Uh, so we have three states here. Uh, the zero one is the initial state, and then we have states one and two, and the transitions between them basically emit the labels. So transition from one to two means that the label is non-speech. These transitions are also weighted. So, I'd hope, so how it works is that the decoder then computes the best path through the composition of these two transducers. I have a small illustration here. So we have the outputs of the DNN on top, then we would have labels without the smoothing. And so the decoder then considers all of the possible hypotheses. So there is a blue one, green one, red one, and so on. 
and based on the smoothing scheme it finds the best one so in this case it would be this one so it goes up through all of them and finds the best one according to the smoothing scheme so now for the setup uh, for the evaluation metrics we used uh, standard for speech activity detection so we have frame error rate which is just a percentage of misclassified frames and then we have miss rate and false alarm rate, which are percentages of misclassified speech and non-speech frames, respectively. Uh, miss rate basically expresses the amount of uh, missed speech, it would, which would be labeled as non-speech. We also monitored uh, the quality of change point. So for this, we uh, computed F measure. So we had to first align the computed and reference change point, and then we expressed hits, insertion, deletions, and finally F measure. For the training of the X vectors, we used three different data sets. Uh, we used the speech data, which is just a collection of Voxelab2, uh, part of LibriSpeech, and some internal Czech microphone recordings. In total, we had over 7,200 speakers. And then we also used noise data uh, from Chime 4 data set and some music data of different genres. For the classification, we used uh, clean speech and clean music for three hours of each. And also we mixed some data to provide more robustness. So we mixed uh, speech and non-speech data according to randomly chosen signal to noise ratio. Uh, and we also concatenate them to uh, contain transitions. And we set the annotation threshold at zero decibel. So everything over zero and speech was labeled as speech and the rest was uh, non-speech. Finally, for the development, uh, we used uh, six hours of real data from TV and radio broadcasts. Uh, these were in four Slavic languages, so we had uh, Czech, Slovak, Polish and Russian. Uh, they consisted of speech and music mostly, but there were also jingles, advertisements and other noises. And the annotations were originally done by our previous decoder and then fine-tuned uh, by hand. So now for the evaluation, uh, I'll follow the same path as with the proposed approach. So first the X vector extraction. Uh, we trained three different extractors. Uh, all were all used the same structure. They were all based on the FSMNs and produces 128 dimensional embeddings. Uh, they differed in the training data. So the first one was trained only on the speech data. So only the 7,247 speakers. And then we try to add a noise class with the Chime 4 data set, and we also try to add music class with the music data. Uh, these X vectors, uh, these extractors were then flowed by the binary classifier and the smoothing. And we also trained for comparison uh, something we used in our previous work, which used the binary classifier and the decoder in the same decoder, but did not use the X vectors. And this also used a much deeper network with some more additional context. So here are the results. Um, so the first three rows uh, are the X vectors. The first one are the speech one, then we have the noise one, then he has the music one. Uh, you can see that uh, the, the baselines were quite good, but the noise X vectors improved the results basically in all metrics, but the music one did not bring anything new. So we went with the noise one, so the noise class were beneficial for this task. And in the last two rows, you can see uh, the effect of the X vectors. Uh, the results were worse, except for the miss rate, but overall they were worse, so we continued with the X vectors. Now for the binary classification, uh, we trained uh, seven different classifiers. Um, we focused on zero context, so we had some shallow networks and one with deeper so we had 0 1 2 and 5 hidden layers and we also tried some more complex architectures so we trained uh, time delay neural networks and fsmns so once again here are the results so the last three rows are the context one uh, you can see that uh, they performed quite similarly slightly worse uh, but uh, they imp they decreased the uh, they increased the computational demand, so they were not fit for the task. And from the no-context networks, the shallower one were the best. So we chose the one hidden layer as a compromise between performance and the demands. 
Finally, the smoothing. So we tried three different smoothing techniques. Uh, the proposed decoder, where we tuned the penalties on different data set. And then we had some moving average with different sizes of the window. And we also tried no smoothing at all. So here are the results in the first row. You can see that the results are, uh, were much worse when we did not use any smoothing, uh, especially the F measure was uh, pretty bad, most terrible. And the uh, decoder based on the weighted finite state transducers were the best because basically the moving average is just one of the hypotheses of the decoder. So it was to be expected, but it was nice to see it as confirmed. Finally, we also wanted to compare on uh, different data sets so we can compare with other works. So we used the standardized data set wood noise limit. Uh, it provides data under three different noise conditions, low, medium, and high noise. Uh, they also have their own metric, half total error rate, which is just an equal weighted average of miss rate and false alarm rate. And they also provide the official training and testing protocol, which we followed. Uh, that basically means we only had to use their data and here are the results they are in the picture in the bottom so here we have the h term the metric then we have the low noise con low noise conditions medium noise conditions and high noise conditions you can also see darker and lighter shades uh, these are the miss rate and uh, false alarm rate contributions to the h term so you can see that here as well and then we have the, some approaches from literature, they are on the right. And then we have the, in the pink is the proposed approach. And in the red is the previous one without the X vectors. So they performed quite comparably. The without the X vectors was slightly better, but they both function perfectly online. And they were better than the approaches we found in the literature. Uh, the list is in the paper. So after that, uh, we tried to implement it in our real speech transcription system. So we used our speech recognizer, uh, which is based on the, once again, on the FSMN architecture and uses Ngram language model. We tested on two data sets. We had one from live news TV channel where 60% of it was speech. And then we have a music radio station where 10% was speech. And we evaluated the standard uh, metrics, uh, word error rate and real time factor. So here are the final results. Uh, so the first row is without uh, the speech activity detection. So it functions as a baseline. And then we have the one with X vectors and one without the X vectors once again. So if you check the real time factor, you can see that uh, it improves significantly. So it means it runs faster. Uh, this was to be expected because mm, the non-speech was uh, detected and not processed. So the improvements is dependent on the amount of non-speech in the recordings. And you can also see that the word error rate was improved. Uh, this is because the non-speech was not transcribed into a gibberish. And here you can see that the X-vectors were slightly better this time. So with that, um, I'd like to conclude my presentation. So uh, we proposed an approach to speech active detection, which is suitable for online use for processing stream data. It's composed of three components, the X-vector extractor, the binary classifier, and the smoothing based on the weighted finite state transducers. And with it, we improved our results on the development data set. We reached close to the state-of-the-art results on the standardized good noise estimate data set. And we also improved the performance of the follow-up real speech transcription system, as I already shown. Uh, and this is all working in online mode. So. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, please ask. Thank you very much. Other questions? I've seen oh, one there. The microphone. The microphone Take the microphone that's okay. lying there on the chair. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Um, with regard to the uh, word rate, do you have a oracle uh, segmentation that you can uh, compare to? Uh, not here, but uh, you mean in the speech? Uh, in the last yeah. Uh, slide, yeah. I think you had um, no segmentation or no smoothing. Yeah. smoothing so only on the speech. Uh, I don't have it here, but it was only like a half percent better than with the speech okay. activity detection. Yeah. So it was quite similar.
OK. A second question here from the floor. Hello, uh, thanks for your presentation. But uh, anyway, uh, you mentioned that the weighted finite state transducer, the method of smoothing, it accomplishes this by finding like a, a best path through uh, a graph of uh, the, the frames, right? Something okay. like that. Uh, so uh, do you have any more details on this? How, uh, like is this a standard algorithm or? Uh, yes, it's, a, it's just a composition. So mm -hmm. you basically compose the two uh, transducers and then it finds the best part. It computes basically each hypothesis. It scores it with the penalties. And uh, because it's online, it also, there is some pruning, so it kills some of the worst hypotheses, but it computes basically this. And when it's sure or close to the sure, so it outputs the label, so. Okay, all right, thank you. So I have a follow-up question. So. Um, Say it, it, it computes every part, so does it grow the length of the audio or because it, it seems like a brute force uh, method, right? Yes, it, it kind of is. Uh, I mean, there is some pruning, so we are not letting it to get too long. So it has some latency. It has mm -hmm. latency around, I think, half, one and a half second. So, but yes, it's, it basically computes all the paths and the one with lower score, they are killed and so on. So. It stops it to grow infinitely, but yeah. Uh, another follow-up. Uh, uh, so, is it uh, minimize? Is it minimizing a certain uh, like graph heuristic or something like that, or is it uh, just uh, ha like how do we determine the best path? I guess is it a certain metric that you use? Oh, it, it's you take the so it computes the outputs from the network, and then you have the the weights of the transitions and you basically compute the uh, lowest score. So you take the the, part, the outputs of the network and then you compute, should I stay in this state? Should I stay in speech, for example, or should I go to non-speech? And then you have the weights and you compute this and this is done in for each frame. And basically you find, and then you compute some, some, some and you find the shortest part. So uh, it also follow up on, on this question. I, I think basically what you're describing is uh, using the Viterbi algorithm. Yeah, it's it's quite similar. <coughs> yeah. Um, so the the transition probabilities you didn't explain how how they were determined, but I assume you either had a guess how to do it or you learned them. Uh, we determined them on different data sets, so they were experimentally. Yeah, but uh, th this usually depends a little bit on, on the data, right? So uh, yes, um, how long uh, someone is speaking depends maybe on whether it's radio or, or TV or something like that. Yes, it's it's dependent on the data, but uh, we are aiming for the broadcast domain, so we are limiting the data a little bit. So we tune it on different broadcast data and then tested it here. Do, do you know what the ratio was roughly or? Uh, we used actually quite similar ratios. It was close for the speech and non-speech transitions. And, and it actually, does it matter? <laughs> uh, yes, it matters. It, it affects the results, so, but as I said, it was experimentally tuned. So. Mm -hmm. I was almost, almost going to ask the same question, but when you're looking at broadcast news on TV or on radio, somebody is paying for the time. So you're going to have much higher density of speech throughout that material. Uh, and I think you showed one of your simulations with, uh, with Timit and some other examples there. So I'm assuming that you could go to some of your actual data and just get statistics on speech, non-speech, and what the turn-taking durations would be. Because the turn-taking durations, one question on whether you're looking at telephone speech would be really important because if they're fast turns, like someone's being interviewed, then you're going back and forth. If it's someone just talking about the news, they're going to be speaking pretty much continuously. So I think those statistics could help a lot in getting the, uh, the proper pre-training data in order to get the system going in the right direction. Yeah, 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 I agree. That's that's a good point. We could, we should try this probably to include the statistic in our next version. I think. 
Great, thank you. There's one quick last question from the audience online. Alexei Guzev asks, uh, why VAD wasn't used for speech, non-speech detection? Uh, I don't think... Uh, I'm not quite sure what he means with voice activity detection. Yeah. That's what you do, actually. Yeah, that's Maybe he means some standard t uh, tools for that. I, I don't I don't know. I, I'm not sure what's the question about, so yeah, sorry. Maybe it means that uh, on the training, like uh, separating the, the training data. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.